Hello, I am Joel Marx, philosopher, and next to me, over that way, I think, is Alan Duncan, philosopher. Hi, Alan. Hello. Uh, yeah. Alan I, I, and I have just met for the first time, although we have had professional dealings before, but we never had the opportunity to use uh, Zoom to actually see each other. Uh, and it makes a big difference and it's really wonderful. Um, and uh, another interesting aspect of this dialogue that we're going to have is that we are on opposite sides of the earth. <laughs> so I'm yes, in Connecticut uh, and where are you, Alan? I'm in uh, Musselbrook, New South Wales in Australia. So quite, quite some distance away. <laughs> I see. And what would be the nearest uh, large city? Probably Newcastle or Sydney. Okay. Yeah, I, I would say that. <laughs> All right. Just, just trying to give the people listening uh, a clue as to whereabouts you are. Now, I, uh, I'm trying to... Um, uh, oh, yes. Speaker view. Okay, I think I click on. Yes, I want. I want to to blow up Alan's uh, visage uh, when he is speaking, um, and I think I know how to do that. Okay, so um, Alan and I, or well, why don't you why don't you say what we're going to talk about? Because I'd actually like you to set the agenda of what you would like to talk about. Sure. Uh, so uh, a, a substantive disagreement, I guess, I brought up in my uh, recent PhD thesis um, between Marx and myself is the, these, uh, the idea of whether or not an amoralist has or can, or, or can dispense with uh, moralized emotions. Um, so my position is, I think, a little more extreme that uh, the, the process of being amoral, having a moral belief in, in full and accepting that and like making that a part of your life is... is yeah, why don't you give a little background, needs... by the way, on amorality for the folks listening too, because that might oh, be a well, novel yeah. concept for them. Sure, sure. So a amorality is, uh, the best way to describe it I've found is uh, this, similar to atheism about, uh, about God, except it's... Uh, a disbelief in mor uh, morals, so uh, so the idea of right and wrong, good and evil, um, that th those concepts do not apply, basically, in the same way that uh, holiness does not apply to the for, for the atheist. Um, so when it, when it comes to our our disagreement, is um, I guess it would be it would be. To, to continue the analogy, it would be sort of like uh, an atheist still experiencing a holy, uh, holy sensation, um, some some feeling of holiness when entering a church, for example. Um, at, at least to my mind, obviously, uh, you you have a different view where you, uh, I believe, look past moral emotions um, as an amor as someone who doesn't believe in them. You still have the emotion, but you you go on anyway. Is that correct? Right, right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's this there's this interesting disagreement. Um, uh, um, how do you think we would best interrogate <laughs> interrogate that? Well, how, how okay, again, the... again to provide a little more background for for the folks listening for uh, for whom this may be all very novel. Um, we do want to be clear that when we're talking about amorality, we're not talking about immorality. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, for the lay person, uh, there may not be a distinction uh, between those two, but uh, it, the kind of discussion that uh, Alan and I have uh, assumes that there is definitely a distinction between somebody who we might say accepts that there certainly is such a thing as right and wrong, but um, but does something wrong anyway, or at least well, how would that work? Or a third party would say that somebody else, a second party, <laughs> somebody else would say you did something wrong. 
you know, meaning morally wrong. Uh, and so you're immoral. But when Alan and I talk about amorality, uh, we mean that a person ha has no sense of right and wrong to begin with. They're like an innocent, as it were. They're like Adam and Eve before the fall. They just, you know, if they, if they do something that a moralist would consider wrong or bad, they themselves have no conception of it's being wrong or bad. They have no conscience. They, it doesn't bother them at all. They, it's just something they do. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's one well, way to get, yeah. Can you yeah, characterize that's, that's it better than that? Describe it. Well, yeah. The, the way I sort of uh, distinguished immoral, immoralism to amorality in, in my thesis was something along the lines of um, some, uh, an immoralist is someone who consistently subverts either their own moral values or those held by their society as a whole. Um, and the consistency, I think, is important to be someone who is immoral. Um, and it, so th this describes you like psychopaths and so on who like cons consistently break the rules and and they may they may believe themselves that it's wrong or, or think that they themselves are screwed up in some way um, yeah but, but com compared to the uh, amoralists who I mean that the, honestly there's a, a wide variety of amoralists uh, from in in the literature who fall oh, under yeah. a lot of different camps right um, right uh, but the sort of immor uh, amoralists sorry that uh, that we we are um, is is again more akin to the atheist. So we eschew moral belief, um, and we don't don't act as if it's true in any sense. Like we we do not we don't take the like moral utterances of others seriously, um, as, as you said, um, and w like we disagree with their foundations and and quite often the results that they they imply. Yeah, you know, again, I'm trying to put myself into the into the mindset of somebody viewing this to whom it's all very novel and unusual, and um, it is it is hard to convey uh, just ex nihilo, you know, <laughs> what, what the distinction we're talking about, especially especially when it appears, and in fact is the case, that you and I not only are trying to distinguish immorality from amorality but we're also saying we kind of like amorality we want to be amoral we think we even are amoral again if you don't make a clear distinction <laughs> yeah. because we don't you and i don't want to say we're immoral right no no we don't want to say we're bad people and we're doing bad things or wrong, morally wrong things. We don't want to say that, but there are two ways in which a person might not want to be considered wrong, morally wrong. One is they themselves accept that there, of course, is such a thing as morality and right and wrong and good and bad and good and evil. And gosh, I don't want to do anything wrong. I don't want to be a bad person. I want to be a good person. I want to do the morally right thing. So when you say that I did something morally wrong, I will resist that and say, oh, no, no, no. You misunderstand. I didn't do anything wrong. Okay, that's one way that a person wouldn't want to be considered immoral or doing something morally wrong. But Alan and I have a different way <laughs> in which we don't want to be considered to be doing something morally wrong or to be immoral because we also don't want to be considered to be doing something morally right or moral neither uh <laughs> we we just say we don't want to use this language we don't want to think in these terms just like we don't want somebody to say that god loves us we certainly don't want somebody to say god god hates us but we also don't think God loves us either because we don't believe in God. So similarly, we don't think we've done anything wrong, but we don't think we've done anything right either. <laughs> you know? yeah. Is that it, Alan? 
Yeah, that's exactly it. And uh, yeah, the the way this often comes out is uh, the mor the moralists in, upon hearing you're a, you're an amoralist says, well, you don't believe Hitler was evil, right? And you're like, yeah, uh, no, right, I, right, I, right, right, right. I don't, of I don't the believe Hitler uh, card. Uh, the Hitler yeah, card. yeah. I yeah. don't believe Gandhi is yeah. good either. Or, uh, or, yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Or Mother Teresa or right, <laughs> whoever else. Yeah. Now, really, it we doesn't apply. You know, you know we, we have to admit that. I mean, you know, if we actually do post this on YouTube, for example, <laughs> we could get in a lot of trouble. You know, the world being what it is, because there are yeah, a lot of people. Sure. You know, especially from the people who who think they're moral. You know, right? Mm -hmm. yes. There are a lot of moralists out there. Capital who would think that our having this conversation that you and I consider to be quite pleasurable, having consequences that we like and, and we think it'll be nice, uh, have consequences for the world that we, we would, would think most people would like. Um, but there's some moralists out there who would hear our having this conversation. They would say, oh, these guys are evil. They are the devil incarnate. We must eradicate them. We must remove them from the face of the earth because they are evil. See, that's, that's the kind of problem you get with morality. You get so worked up about things that you want to go out and kill people. And now, you know, one also, but you know, then, then the moralist will say, okay, look, nobody, you don't have to get that extreme about it, but come on, Hitler? You really yeah. <laughs> want you really don't want to say that Hitler was a bad guy and that he did things that were wrong. You really don't want to say that. And look, we we've got to get clear on this. I mean, do you want me to say more at the or do you want to talk to that point? What what do we how do we explain to a person in such a way that they understand that our saying that we don't think Hitler was evil doesn't mean what they think it means? Do yeah, you have a way so to explain that? I, I really, yeah. So c compared to the moralist who will look at Hitler and say, uh, "Look, uh, he's evil, evil guy. Like, did horrific things, uh, and that I can agree with. Horrific things, absolutely. I uh, do not like anything Hitler did. <laughs> and and yeah. So it, there's there's a there's a big distinction between someone uh, someone like us who would say, well, Hitler's not evil, and someone who is a say a Holocaust denier. Who right. That exactly. Hitler did something exactly. good. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. We're not Holocaust deniers. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> and we 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 you know I'm sure if we had uh, lived at the time of of World War II, we would have wanted to see Hitler. Eliminated Absolutely. without any qualms about it, you know, no question. But the but the sad fact is, he would have wanted to see us eliminated too, especially me. Um, and and this the stark, astonishing fact for amoralists like Alan and me is that. That's all there is to it. There's no third point of view occupied by God that says, well, you know, Alan and Joel want to eliminate Hitler and Hitler wants to eliminate Alan and Joel. There's no third point of view that says, ah, Hitler is wrong and bad you no know, and alan and joel are good we don't we don't think there is a third it would be nice we'd like to believe it but so would hitler hitler, hitler would also like to believe there's a third point of view and of course from that according to hitler from the third that godlike point of view hitler's the good guy and we're the bad guys right and we amoralists are saying, sorry, there is there's no third point of view, this objective, absolute, true, factual point of view about right and wrong, sorry, but the compensating factor, and th this is what it took me a long time to realize, and I'm very curious to hear your personal story about Alan, about this too, Alan, how, how you arrived at this revelation, okay? 
but it took me a lot of painful thinking to realize, at least to my own satisfaction, that it's okay. It's enough that Alan and I really want to eliminate Hitler. That's enough. That's all we need to guide our lives, our behavior. You can't ask for any more than that because there isn't any more than that, but that is enough. What do you think about that, Alan? Yeah, the, the, desire, the, the desire portion is, uh, is key. Like uh, our, our moderating, uh, yeah, the, the, that, that's what I'd call it. The moderating factor of our behavior is desire uh, more, more simply, I guess, than the moralist who might see a sort of conflict there between a desire and uh, a sort of super, super right. ego, uh, super right. egoistic desire um, to do good. Um, right. And yeah, so I mean, how, how, how did you reach that realization? What's your personal uh, story? So, I mean, it's, it reminds me a bit of uh, your book, actually, the uh, hard atheism. Um, and and the ethics of desire that was an your book uh so so it sort of starts with like with with straightforward atheism um and not not just that but sort of before i like was even philosophy like educated philosophically i was thinking about like determinism and and free will um and it seemed to me that these contradicted and that they sort of like they like that that eliminates like personal responsibility. Um, so so I, I came across that that kind of dichotomy in that debate, and I like after after reading a, a few papers from uh, like uh, for my honors year, I I was sort of like getting the idea that all the, all this moral stuff it it does it just doesn't doesn't adhere to anything. There's nothing, no, no truth of the matter. Um, and that I just fundamentally couldn't make it work with the way I understood reality, like a material reality. Um, and I, I couldn't, couldn't see that. Um, so for my PhD thesis, I was like, I want to explore this. Um, and so I, I submitted the thing, like I, I want, to, want to interrogate this notion that I'm having, that mor mor morality just doesn't adhere to anything. Um, and like, I, w I want to be rid of it. it, it like it, it was, it, it annoyed me, right? Because it just, it didn't fit with anything. These orts that people were saying, like they were contradicting, causing like conflicts that I, I couldn't understand on a fundamental level. Um, and that, yeah, th that, I guess that's what drove it to begin with. And then of course I started reading like, Richard Garner's Abolishing Morality, your uh, um, ethics. Um, and I, fa I found my comrades, <laughs> I guess, in that way. Um, but yeah, so I would say it really started with, uh, with the free will debate, right. um, mm -hmm. things surrounding that. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, of course, atheism, because as, as you mentioned, there, there is this, uh, this imagined third person who people have like uh, certainly religious people say is God who will judge your actions. And some such as Richard, uh, Richard Dawkins uh, would say, uh, even, even without God, there is still right and wrong, but they, there's there, they haven't replaced God with anything. There's nothing, not, no third entity who is correct about what you ought to do. So, yeah, I guess I guess that's our disagreement with, with the uh, atheists of the Richard Dawkins variety. Right, they call themselves the new atheists, right? Mm, yes. Yeah, yeah, right. We 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 take issue with the new atheists. That's why I came up with the concept of hard atheism. Yeah. A hard atheist, as I understand it, is is one who says, "Well, if you don't believe in God, then you can't believe in morality." Uh, and, and of course, that's what a lot of religious people say. I mean, oddly, yeah. oddly enough, Richard, Richard Garner pointed this out to me. Actually, religious people are hard atheists. 
Yeah, absolutely. In, in that, you know, they they link God with morality. I I accept, you know, when I now I used to when before I discovered a morality, uh, I I accepted that uh, the idea that uh, we could do without God and still have morality, which is yeah, what the absolutely. new the new atheists say abundantly. They they fervently believe that you can still have morality without God. So I call them now soft atheists. <laughs> uh, so 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 yeah, you you Alan and I turn out both to be hard atheists and we're atheists, right? Whereas a religious yeah. person, a theist could also be a hard atheist, <laughs> but is a theist <laughs> who believes that you know, if you don't have God, you don't have morality. But the theist says, but there is a God. So we do have morality. You know? But yeah. we are hard atheists and we're atheists who say, right. It's a, it's you an don't have God, you don't have morality. And by the way, there is no God, so there is no morality. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, yeah. Okay, now, you know, I, I would, I'm curious what you think about this. I, I am certainly open to uh, somebody arguing that morality, uh, well, no, okay, sorry, sorry to backtrack, because again, things get a little complicated here. Yes, All right. absolutely. So let, let us also explain for our listeners, if we have any, <laughs> that there are two ways to be an amoralist. I mean, of course, there are many ways, but the two that you and I probably focus on are, one, there is no such thing as objective right and wrong, so forth. Okay. And the other way is whether or not there is an objective right or wrong. But typically we would say, well, assuming there is no such thing as objective right and wrong. One might still think that the belief in morality serves a very useful purpose in society. Uh, in fact, that's why so many people do believe in morality because, and it might even be hardwired to some degree because it has proved evolutionarily to be important for human survival, perhaps. Um, just like the belief in God yeah. has probably been very useful in, in, in the survival of Homo sapiens. Uh, and, you know, a, a, a Darwinian could probably tell some story about how natural selection favored the primates who believed in God over the ones who did not believe in God. Maybe because they were more ready to, they were more courageous because they weren't afraid of death because they felt they would go to a, a, an eternal afterlife after death. Whereas the ones who didn't believe in God didn't believe in such a thing. And so they were less courageous. And so the ones who were more courageous you know, wiped out the ones who were less courageous, something like that. Yeah, that would be um, a typical evolutionary explanation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. some kind of just so story. Yes. Uh, and you could, tell, you could tell an analogous story about morality. You know, the people believe, who believe in objective right and wrong had some kind of advantage over the people like you and me who don't believe in it. And so the people like you and me were, you know, practically eliminated. Uh, from existence and, and just about everybody who survived, you know, fervently believes in it. But nonetheless, even though they believe in it, it could be false, right? Beliefs have the quality, it's in the very nature of a belief that a belief can be either true or false, right? If you believe in leprechauns, well, you, have, you can believe it, but you have a false belief. If you believe in centaurs, you know, you have the belief, but it's a, it's a false belief and so forth and so forth. So you and I want to say, well, if you believe in objective right and wrong, yeah, you believe it, 
but it's a false belief. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. So that that's that's one kind of amorality. That's the kind of amorality that says there is no such thing as objective right and wrong. And if you believe it, you have a false belief. But the other kind of amorality is that not only is the belief false, it's noxious. It has, it has effects that people like Alan and me don't like. And Alan, Alan and I would probably agree, you can correct me if I'm mistaken here, Alan and I would probably agree that um, we think most people, if they thought about it, if they heard us out, if they read my book and Alan's dissertation and so forth, they would come to agree with us. Uh, or even if they hadn't read, even if they'd never heard of amorality, maybe if they simply were exposed to uh, somehow they had the opportunity to visit a society which was amoral in, in the way that Alan and I like. And then they went back to their own society which was very moral, moralistic in the way most societies are. Alan and I might predict that they would actually prefer that amoral society that they had visited. Is that correct, Alan? Would you feel that way? Would you make that prediction? I mean, I, I have a certain distaste for counterfactual kind, kind of like things like that. And I mean, this, this, is, a, this is a discussion in and of, in of itself, um, especially in terms of like the, the political ramifications of everything. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, uh, broadly speaking, I think, I think if people were to interrogate the subject with as, as, as much as you and I have, that I think I think a lot of them would feel the same. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean that that's that's perhaps not our major concern mm. uh, because you know you and I we're philosophers and we seek truth uh, and even if most people will never believe the truth you and I would like to believe the truth or we yeah. at least like to believe that we believe the truth. <laughs> well, so, something like uh, coherence with reality is what I I would like to call it. Oh, I like it. Yes. Okay. Coherence with reality. Yeah. Okay. And I we, think, uh, I think it, it comes with a lot of positive effects. Well, positive, be care careful of that word positive. <laughs> Make sure you're not using it. Pleasant, in an enjoyable. Way. Yeah. All right. I'm even having problems with the word true lately. Oh, yes. M me too, which is why, no, why I mentioned my coherence with reality thing. All right. Good for you. But no. that's another question about coherence with reality. Absolutely. That's another, yeah. But but as you said, you said before, that's another discussion. Everything is another mm -hmm. discussion for a philosopher. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Uh, but but um, in fact, the 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 book that I've just finished writing, which will be published later this year, actually by Routledge, called um, Reason and Ethics. You heard it here first, folks. That's the title of this next book. Um, that actually begins with my, you know, taking this, this new, even more radical departure, more radical for me, of saying, not only don't I believe in right and wrong anymore, I don't believe in true and false anymore, you know, which, <laughs> which is, that's very painful. <laughs> but I make the best case that I can in the book, mm. you know, and again, what I really mean by that may not turn out to be as you know, horrifying <laughs> or absurd as it sounds at first. But, um, but, you know, as a short slogan, that's it. I don't believe in true and, true and falsity anymore either. Uh, but um, anyway, so the topic that uh, you and I had set out to discuss now but then one thing led to another and another because we actually we had to provide people with some background first, right? But I, yeah. but I think the topic that we really wanted to try to focus on was um, what is the status of moral feelings for, an, for somebody who claims to be an amoralist? 
Um, now, now remember, I had said there are two, time, two, two ways to be an amoralist. Um, and so, so to make the, the issue we want to discuss more precise, I'll say, supposing you're somebody like Alan or me, um, who believes there's no such thing as objective right and wrong, or good and bad, okay? Um, and furthermore, you even want to be the other kind of amoralist, the, more, the, the even more radical kind of amoralist, who thinks there's no use or there's, there's net negative utility, to use a, put it in technical terms. It, it, it would be better overall, not better. We, we think uh, the world would be more to our liking if people fully recognized and believed that there is no objective right and wrong. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would put it even a different way, which is... Okay the world is more to my liking viewing things this way. Um, the way, the way it, it, because when you, when you do this, you have your, your amoral epiphany, um, I guess. It, it genuinely can change how you view people, how you interact with people. How, and it's, it's liberating, I would say. Um, and yeah, that, that's, that's the line or the angle I would take. Okay, fine, fine. Uh, so given that, okay, and so given that Alan and I uh, believe these things are and are aspiring to live our lives, to, to walk the talk, you know, to live our lives as a amoralists in the fullest sense, uh, if only as, a, as an empirical demonstration that it's possible. What's, what's the point of having these theoretical ideas, especially in ethics, which is a very practical, supposedly, has the very practical concern about figuring out how to actually live life, you know? What's the point of it if we can't actually live life in this way that we are recommending or say is, is actually embodies truth? So now Alan, as I understand it, having read his work, some of his work, Alan believes that he's living that life and, and it's great and it's not really a big problem to live that way. And I say more power to him. I'm a little skeptical, but we'll, we'll have this discussion. Let's see what he has to say. Whereas I, as much as I aspire to live as a full-blooded a moralist. I don't. I don't think I'm capable of it. Um, because for for two sorts of reasons, at least, one uh, is just that I'm. Uh, I grew up as a moralist, believing fervently. Really, I was an arch moralist, believing fervently in right and wrong and good and bad, and even making it into my professional career as a philosophical ethicist and teaching students for decades <laughs> about objective right and wrong and how important it is and applying it to their careers and da 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 da, -da. Um, It was my whole life, personally and professionally, to a fault, literally to a fault. I was very moralistic. It created problems with my human relationships and still does, okay? Being a moralist, a moralist, not an amoralist, but being <laughs> a moralist, right? <laughs> okay, that, and that, that's one reason why I, I doubt whether I can ever become the full-blooded amoralist that I aspire to be. Another reason is I strongly suspect that it's hardwired in human beings. Uh, because again, we can tell a fairly persuasive Darwinian story 
about why primates who believed in objective right and wrong would be more likely to survive than those who didn't believe in objective right and wrong. And so I think it's highly likely that natural selection selected you know, the, the, the subspecies of Homo, Homo sapiens, to become, to, to be, to, 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 to believe, you know, in objective right and wrong. And, and you can't get rid of something like that if it's hardwired. You just can't get rid of it. Um, so that's why I, more humbly than Alan, <laughs> think that, I don't think I can be a full-blooded amoralist, and, and I'm skeptical that Alan can be. So what do you want to say about all that, Alan? Well, Michael Ruse, who was uh, an uh, evolutionist type, uh, type uh, scholar, said that you would need a steady diet of hard drugs to uh, do without morality <laughs> or, or something <laughs> akin to this. Uh, obviously, I disagree. <laughs> I disagree. Um, if we if we just look at the evolutionary example, um, and this this is a roundabout way of, of doing it to some extent, but it it helps with the argument. I feel to say uh, a lot of people said the same thing about uh, religion. They say uh, it's it's, ah, uh, it's like there are no right. atheists in foxholes. Right. Um, that, and they were wrong, term. weren't they? Quite wrong. Yes. Yeah. Um, it turns good, out good. that. Good idea. Even even if these things are somewhat hardwired, and I'll, I'll I'll just grant that that you can undo the wiring somewhat through conscious effort and thought, um, yeah. and that that's sort of sort of what I conceive of of my early life doing in in interrogating these ideas. Um, you started yeah, at a much younger that. age than I, so hmm. you know you didn't have to undo as much as I would have to. So that could be, so just our difference in age could explain the difference in our ability to become full-blooded amoralists, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that's possible. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't limit you in that way. I think it's still, uh, still doable, but- uh, Thank you, thank you. But yeah, it's, uh, it's very, that's a, that's a possibility. Um, that's good, yeah. That's a good argument. I mean, I like the argument. I won't say it's a good argument, right? I can't talk like that. I, uh, well, that's not necessarily an ethical term. A yes, use that, that's not an ethical good. It's, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But anyway, I like it. Uh, and, and okay, so I actually have a variation on that to offer. Uh, I repeat this all the time because I think it's really one of my most delicious argument, <laughs> it's my most delicious, I was an argument image or whatever, most effective images, all right? I think of my situation and most people's situation as um, analogous to visual illusions. So I don't think anybody, or I don't think most people who find out that something is a visual illusion are capable of dispelling that illusion, because I think it's hardwired in our vision. Uh, and like the standard illusion of the Muller liar illusion of two parallel lines that have arrows at the end, but the arrows point in different directions. And as a result, these two parallel lines, which are in fact of the same length, appear to be of different lengths. Do you know the illusion I'm talking about? Yeah, I'm familiar with a lot of that. I did. Uh undergrad in psychology so we like we look through like all of those there's uh there's ones like uh the spiral illusion is my favorite one you stare at a spiral for long enough and then you look away and it warps your field of view mm -hmm. um so obviously you cannot turn stuff like that off it's it's a right. as you say hardwired into your perception right so so i i analogize my moral impulses to a visual illusion. So just as I can know that the two parallel lines in the Muller-Lear illusion are the same length, but still cannot help still seeing them as unequal in length in, a, in visual appearance, just so I can know 
and really believe in my heart of hearts that there's no such thing as objective right and wrong. And yet, I will continue to feel that, oh, what that person did, that's really wrong. I hate that. I'm outraged by that. I will still have that feeling, just the way I will still see the, the lines in the Muller-Lear illusion as of unequal length. But in both cases, I can know that what I'm feeling or seeing is an illusion. In other words, I can, I cannot be deluded by them. To be deluded is to believe your illusion. Yeah. So I will always retain the illusions of morality, but I can dispel, but I can do, but, but I can not be deluded into believing in morality. What do you think of that as a compromise solution, Alan? I do genuinely think it is a, a compromised solution, <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it's better than nothing for sure. Um, it, it is better to better to understand the limitations you're working within and be able to work. Yeah, with like it. me, I'm the I'm the main limitation I'm working <laughs> with. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I mean, if okay, uh, I think I think you pose this hypothetical in your book at some point. But if you could take the pill that turns those off, turns off that illusion. Do you yeah. think you would, you would do it? Ah, ah, very good. Very good, Alan. Uh, you're, you're throwing my own thought experiment, my own Gedanken experiment back at me here. If, if, I was confident that this pill could eliminate my moralistic feelings of, oh, that's wrong, that's bad, that's evil, that's good, that's wonderful. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's really a, the right thing to do. And if I could eliminate those feelings so that I would only be left with non-moral feelings and desires like um, like uh, oh I I I instead of saying oh I think that's really wrong a feeling instead of feeling that's wrong I was just feel oh I don't I don't like that um, that that it, it hurts me it's frustrating my desire that everybody be uh, be pain free to see that person being put in pain and that other person beating him and, and causing him pain for no reason at all. I feel very bad about that. I empathize with the pain of the person being beaten. And um, I really, really, really want that other person to stop beating him and so forth and so forth. So I would only have that kind of desire left, but I wouldn't say, oh, what a nasty fellow beating him for no reason. He's evil. He's wrong. He's doing the wrong thing. Da, da, da. Would I take that pill? Would I take that pill? Now, the reason I'm hesitating to say, of course I would, because after all, I, I claim to aspire to be a full-blooded amoralist, so why, why would I hesitate to take the pill? I suspect that my main hesitation is due not to my doubts about uh, whether I would like amorality or not, being fully amoral or not, but rather that it's hard for me to put my mind into a thought experiment that I think is empirically unlikely to occur. I, I, in other words, I, don't, I have ge a general skepticism of the human ability to create a pill that will be foolproof that will actually perform as advertised without having some unexpected and unpleasant side effects that could gum up the works entirely. I think that would be the main reason I hesitate to say, oh yes, of course, you know, because I, I really can't, and this is, the, this is not my idea alone. I think a lot of people are very skeptical of thought experiments because they think they just, 
you know, they are just thought experiments. They're not really empirical possibilities because in real life, it's very, you know, everything is imperfect in real life. Uh, so we can't really put ourselves into the, to that mindset to really do the experiment, even in thought. What do you think of that response, Alan? I mean, uh, I, I, I'm sympathetic with the response in the same way that I'm sympathetic with uh, like a rejection of sort of like counterfactual, counterfactual claims. Um, but hmm, you're making me locate the core of what I'm trying to get at, which is always, always why the kind of like the, uh, the, the uh, thought experiment comes up is you're trying to avoid that. You're trying to make the other person do it. <laughs> well, wait, okay, Here, here's, another, here's another reason I would hesitate then, okay? Okay. Um, remember that if I take the pill, I become a different person. Yeah. Okay? So when you ask me, well, would you take the pill? I think what you're really getting at is, do you think you'd prefer being the person who has taken the pill to the person who didn't take the pill. Yeah, that's another way to put it. Okay, but that becomes very tricky. As I pointed out in my book, Hard Atheism and the Ethics of Desire, that becomes very tricky to perform as a thought experiment, even if we assume the pill functions as advertised perfectly. Because who is it who is supposed to judge the outcome of this experiment? Is it the person who hasn't taken the pill? Is it Joel before he takes the pill? Or is it Joel after he takes the pill? Which one of us are you asking the question, which state do you prefer? Um, now, of course, it can't be the person, well, you, you were asking the person who hadn't taken, you were asking, say, you said, would you take the pill? So you're asking the person who doesn't know what it's like yet because he hasn't taken the pill yet. So how, how can I decide if I haven't taken the pill yet if it was a good idea to take the pill? Yeah. Or if it would I, be a good idea? I, I'm not in a position to judge. Okay, so then I take the pill. Am I now in a position to judge? Because, you know, now... I've experienced both. I know what it was like not to have taken the pill. And I now know what it is like to have taken the pill. But of course, now I have a different set of values because I took the pill. Yeah, you have no values. I have no moral values. <laughs> well, right, maybe I, it, depending on how you use the word values, in some sense, I have no values. I have only desires. I have Indeed. subjective values, if you want to use that term. You know, I know what I like. I really value, sure. you know, such and such, which just Cup means I really like it. Yeah, yeah, it's important to me. Uh, but yeah, in a sense, I have no values. So, so who, who are you asking the question of? And do, does the answer, and would either person be in a position to answer the question that you really want me to be asking? Because aren't yes. they both biased? Absolutely. Uh, However, so? I mean, I, I, I've, I've struggled with this exact literal question before. Um, Good. And what's, when, what's the solution? <laughs> when I was a child. Uh, oh, when you were a child. Excuse me. Well, child, you know, philosophers was... must become as children to <laughs> rethink everything anew from start. Go well, on. <laughs> even, even as children, we struggle with belief systems. And I... I went to a Christian school, right? I, oh, I was really? nominationally, yes. Uh, I was, ah. uh, in some sense, a Christian uh, to the extent right. of Oh, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. Um, right. And right. I, strugg I struggled with that exact question. I, I would be like, should I, should I try this, uh, this other belief system? Um, mm -hmm. And would I, like, if, if I do judge it um, from the perspective of not having it, like, what won't that won't that be in some sense corrupted or uh, because it's because it's already taken the leap as it were from uh, from christianity to atheism right and right. 
right, this, right. The, the answer I came up with and the only distinguishing thing that made sense to me is that one of those two people have tried both. Yeah. And who, who is in a better posi position, I think, to say which is better than someone who has tried both compared to someone who has tried only one? Well, that's what exactly what John Stuart Mill said, you know, in utilitarianism. Hmm. Uh, and uh, and I, I used to accept that answer myself. Now, you thought of it all by yourself, so that shows you're just as brilliant as John Stuart Mill, who was a brilliant person. I don't person. know about that. <laughs> no. Well, of course, that was an invalid inference that I just made, but I was trying to compliment you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. Okay. It was an invalid compliment. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, but I hope a true one nonetheless, right? Because a, a conclusion that is invalidly drawn may nonetheless be true, right? Yeah, and an argument that's, uh, that's made that's false may still be brilliant. Yes, that's true too. Okay, right, right. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but, but I, I don't buy it. I don't think I buy it anymore. I, I mean, it sounded very clever. It sounds very plausible. Yes, of course, the person who's experienced both is in a better position. Uh, no, for example, um, okay, well, okay, here I am an old guy and you're a young guy, right? Well, as an old guy, I've experienced what it is to be a young guy and an old guy. You have only experienced what it is to be a young guy. Therefore, all the advice that I give you is better than any advice you could possibly give me because about life, you know, or about how easy it is to become a full-blooded amoralist or anything like that. Because I know what it's like, you know, I know about more of life than you. And that's why old people think they're so wise and sage and, and all these young people don't know what they're talking about, you know, so there, what do you think of that? <laughs> well, I mean, okay. Uh, I, think, I think it would have to be, I, th I think the difference between those two things is the implication that say being older implies that you've had all the same thoughts and experiences the young person has had. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this, in this specific example of the amoralist pill, we have two very specific people in mind and we, I think we both roughly know what the other means. I mean, you, you obviously don't have the full like field of the same fit understanding of what it's like to take the pill uh, as I would, but we both have like the same rough ideas of the spheres of belief and uh, like the spheres of uh, the feelings we would be talking about. Whereas like a, an old person saying, ah, oh, look, I've lived, I've experienced more, um, I'm wiser. It may, it may be true, but it may also not be true because they do not have the same experiences that the okay. other person has had. Right. And clearly, if it's one and the same person taking the pill, then definitely the person who took the pill had also the experience of the person who didn't take the pill. If it's yes. one and the same person. Well, you know, I mean, that, if, it, that's if, the it's, situation if it's one I was and the same about. pill, uh, yeah. If, I, I think if it's one and the same pill, because we're talking, I mean, in this case, it's about moralized emotions, but it's, it's in, a, in a sense, a subset of belief. Um, if, if, you, if you genuinely think, and I, I do to some degree, that the, the, some beliefs are causing these moralized emo emotions, or they're at least like intrinsically interrelated to them. And I, I would say they definitely are. And th this is, this is, the core of our disagreement, I guess, is that I sense that there's some some set of lingering beliefs which are causing moralized emotions. Uh huh. And I'm I'm, I'm uh, having read your work. I'm not sure what they would be, um, or, or possibly it, it could be possibly that without any other frame of reference, any other explanations, you've you've removed something. You've taken away this belief in morality but you may, may have had nothing to replace the uh, sort of role that it, it had. So you still still have these lingering. Uh, well, and lingering yes, effects. also, I mean, I, is, you said you're a materialist and so am I. Um, and I take that to suggest that 
beliefs can be just as stubborn as desires. You know, some, some people who are very rationalistic think, oh, well, as soon as somebody shows you a, a, a sound argument that explodes uh, your belief and shows that it's false, you know, if you're rational, you'll just stop believing it like that. Oh, I but I, I would assume as a materialist that a belief is, you know, to use that phrase again, no, well, not hardwired in the sense of being there necessarily genetically. No, it, but, it, you know, if you have a stable belief, if you had a belief for a number of years, I assume there's some connection of synapses in the brain, literally, that yes. is that belief or sustains that belief. And you can't just necessarily like that undo those all those connections because it could be no. connected to a thousand different things and, and it absolutely would be especially if it's something yeah. like like moral belief right um, right and but but but, but, of... but now so you've won the battle and lost the war though haven't you because i i have admitted it... that it may be harder for for someone who is older or like uh has experienced uh more have, has more of these interrelations it may be more difficult Certainly, and the, but the yeah, I, I I agree that it, it may be more difficult, but I, I think I I am hopeful that it's possible. I don't know that it's possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, but and it, but, I think it's worth yeah. doing. If, okay, if but anyway, possible. you know, we're we're both we're, we're both making you know valid points, and which is what we would expect in any philosophical issue. Uh, mm. But I would again just go back to to my earlier point that. Uh, you know, if if you've got, just because, well, again, to, to just take a, you know, maybe it's a silly example, but I don't think it's silly because I think it's getting at a, a valid point. But just to make the point clearly and vividly, uh, if we take you and then, and then you take a pill that makes you senile <laughs> you know well who's in a better position to judge anything you know which is better so you become senile oh, okay, okay I, I see right what you're at. right yeah. and so we say okay well you're the one who's had both experiences which do you think is the better state of being and you say well i'm very happy right now <laughs> you know and I think everything is just perfect. I think this is the way I would want to be all the time. Now, what do you think of that, huh? I mean, I could, I could very well bite the bullet on that. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, all right, okay. However, but, but the difference is that in the senile person, they, they are missing something. They, they, they are very definitely missing something, and that is their past experiences. By, uh -huh. by definition of being senile, they're missing the ability to compare ah, the two. Ah, good, 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 good. All right, all right. Clever, clever, clever. All right. You, you are truly a philosopher. <laughs> I admit you into the ranks <laughs> of the exalted profession. Well, I mean, you almost literally did. <laughs> and you, you marked my thesis. <laughs> oh yeah, there was that too. <laughs> well, I made the right choice. No, I'm glad to hear it. All right. So, da 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 da. You you with the pandemic, you haven't been able to have the official That's graduation right. ceremony. That's right. So here we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this has been a fantastic discussion, and I think I will bring this recording to a close and, and we might post it for the benefit of humanity, right? Because we're both very altruistic types, even though we're completely amoral, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alan. <laughs>